Hey everyone, welcome to this session by IntelliPath. We present to you the top 50 data structure interview questions that you can use to ace all of the interviews and to help you land your dream job. This is a compilation of questions which have the highest amount of probability to be asked in any data structures interview. So even if you're a beginner, an intermediate person or an advanced learner, we are sure that you can take away an ample amount of information from this video. Well, before before we begin with this session, make sure to subscribe to the IntelliPaths YouTube channel and hit that bell icon so that you don't miss any updates from us. With that, let us move to the first question. Of course, the first question will be what are data structures? Well, data structures are the well, data structures are actually methods and techniques which are used to handle and store data in an organized manner. Well, basically when answering this question, make sure not only to explain about all of the data structures that are present, such as linked lists, stacks, arrays and whatnot, but make sure that you have an understanding of what data structures are. Basically, all of these data structures are used to attain a common goal. That is to either build a dependency in terms of data entities, to build and manage relationships between the data entities, or to even produce meaningful connections in between data. So basically, these are the entities, methods and techniques which are used to store data in an organized manner. Well, coming to question number two. What is the difference between a file structure and a data structure? Well, a file structure is an entity which gets stored only on the hard disk drive or only on the local storage. But then when you're talking about data structures, data structures have the ability to natively be stored both on the RAM, that is the random access memory and the hard disk at the same time. Then coming to the second point, uh, there are certain policies which guide the storage of data. So with respect to file structures, uh, we have the standard file storage policies which works across based on the operating systems and how the data is supposed to be stored. But then when we work with data structures, there are customized storage policies which make uh, the use of data structures very efficient and increases the read-write capability where you can access it faster, read the data faster and write it faster as well. And then coming to the third point, third point basically talks about the compatibility when you're working with external applications. There is a low compatibility when you work with file structures because of point number two, one being it has standard file storage policies. And the second thing being that, so most of the applications are basically written based on the individual unit entities uh, whenever data is in concern. So whenever data is supposed to be stored, each individual entity of data is actually in concern when developing policies and when finding out methods to basically store them. But then with data structures, it provides a high compatibility whenever you're storing with external applications because this unit entity that we just spoke about is basically already optimized uh, in this particular case. That brings us to question number three. What is a linked list? Well, this has to be one of the questions that will surely be asked because linked lists form a very vital aspect of data structures and linked lists are nothing but the most used uh, data structures in today's world because uh, these form very nice methodologies and these provide very nice ways the user can store and handle data where every individual element in a linked list is called as a node and each of these nodes form a chain like structure whenever you connect it uh, to other nodes. You know, each node will have the data present to it and a certain address associated with it. This address is used to basically access the data and then of course the data can be changed however required. You know, there are many types of linked lists. There are single linked lists, there's double linked lists, there's circular linked lists and more. And with that, we have question number four. Well, uh, where are data structures primarily used? You know, you can answer this question based on multiple factors. Uh, one being that you can find data structures almost everywhere around you in the world. Data structures are an integral part of almost everything with respect to information technology. Everything from numerical computation, operating system design, artificial intelligence, compiler design, all the way until statistics. Data structures pave to be one of the foundational concepts which are very much required in today's world to handle data and to find the most 
efficient way and the easiest way to do it. See, at the end of the day, you're converting raw data into useful information. Finding the most effective way to do that in a structured environment is where data structures shine the most. So make sure to quote at least uh, four or five uh, places and concepts where data structures are used. And it would, of course, be advantageous if you could explain on where it is used. For example, if you're talking about data structures are used in database handling, just don't state database handling, uh, you know, just go on to explain one or two lines where you're stating that, uh, you know, they are used to form entities uh, such as linked lists. It can be stacks and queues and these stacks and queues provide a way to have organized access to data. So make sure to elaborate a single point uh, based on the usage that you have mentioned. Coming to question number five, what are the types of searching methodologies used in data structures? Well, well, there's two main types of searching when you come, whenever you talk about data structures, it's linear search and it's binary search. Linear search, as the name suggests, is basically moving across the data in a linear fashion. Linear fashion basically means one after the other in a certain order. When you talk about binary search, binary search is a better form of searching because it's more efficient, number one. Number two is that it splits the data in the, in the middle and then it, it just forms two entities where it can search on the left side of that and on the right side of the data if the number is lesser or greater respectively. More on binary search in the next couple of questions. But then at this point of time, you need to know that there are two types of searching, linear and binary, where linear is a simple form of searching in a set of order either from left to right or right to left and binary search involves breaking the data into smaller chunks searching in that break it again if required and search and this can be performed many number of times coming to question number six how does binary search work yes this would be a very important question which has a very very high probability of being asked well binary search as the name suggests uh it's two entities the first thing you have to always remember when you work with binary search is that it'll only work on sorted data. Well, your data either has to be sorted in the ascending order or the descending order compulsorily. And once you have the uh, ordered data, basically you have an array. Let's say you have an array. And basically, if you have to search an element in this particular array, the first thing you'll do is you'll find the middle element of it. If it's an even number, your middle number will be considered as the average of those two numbers. But then if you have an odd number, you will find one singular middle element. So then the data is basically split into the left side and the right side. Now, if you arranged it in the, in the ascending order, uh, let's say we have uh, top seven elements, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, four will be the middle element, right? So if you're searching for three, then of course you already know that you don't have to search up and above four because it won't be there. Your data is already in the ascending order. So you'll of course search below four. Then again, you will split it into one, two, three, four, where uh, one and two can be put into one side, three and four can be put into the other side and search. So this goes on in an iterative order. It's basically all dependent on the order of arrangement and what value you are searching for. Binary search is really simple to implement considering that you know how the process of iteration works and how it can be put into effective use. Coming to question number seven, how are individual elements accessed in an array? Well, whenever you talk about arrays, there is a concept called as indexing. Indexing is basically denoting the position of elements in an array. And whenever you talk about arrays uh, and in majority of the programming languages out there, the first position will always begin with zero rather than one. So if you have an array size of say 10 elements, the last element will not be 10, it will be 9. Because n, if n is the number of elements in the array, then the last element is n minus 1. It is n minus 1 because we are starting from 0 and not from n. And then whenever you talk about indexing, you can access any element that you desire from this array at any point of time. If you want the sixth element, let's say you have an array which is the, of the name A and you want the fifth element to it. If you want the fifth element of array A, you'll be accessing A of 4. A of 4 because A of 0 is the first one, A of 1 is the second one, A of 2 is the third one and all the way until, uh, you know, A of 4 which becomes the fifth element basically. 
So yes, individual elements can be accessed. And when you talk about multidimensional arrays, multidimensional arrays are basically spanned across rows and columns and more. So uh, a row entity will have a separate index, a column entity will have a separate index. So when you have these two index indices mapped side by side together, a of 2 comma 3 or a of, uh, of course, it'll be in brackets, a of brackets 2, big brackets 3. This will denote a specific element, say, in that particular column and in the particular row in discussion as well. So I hope I was clear with that. Now coming to question number 8. Question number 8 says, what is a queue in data structures? Well, a queue is one of the most used data structures, in fact, in real life as well. We so the data structure entity such as queue was basically based on the real life fact that we use queues everywhere. So whenever we talk about queues as a data structure, you need to understand that it is all about accessing something in order, adding an element to an array in order or removal. So order is everything when we talk about queues, because as a literal queue, let's say whenever you go to the shopping mart or to pick up anything, you, you get in from one direction, you pick up something, there are people behind you and you get away. Uh, from the front of the queue, right? So basically that. It's first come, it's, it's basically first come, first served. Uh, if you're first in the queue, you are served and you are sent off. If you're last in the queue, then you have to work your way towards the front end and basically get your order done, right? So that's exactly how uh, queues work here as well. Of course, whenever we talk about queues in literal, there's elements such as the top element, there's the uh, front element where, you know, uh, the data exits, the top element is where the data comes in and much more. Of course, you can choose to write a tiny piece of code which will denote an array and how a queue can be implemented as well. This will effectively improve your candidature there too. And of course, it will impress the hiring manager as well. Coming to question number nine, what is a binary tree? A binary tree, as the name suggests, it's basically a tree-like structure which has one primary node and then this primary node or the main node or it's called as a root node as well. So this root node is split into two nodes and one is on the left and one is on the right. Hence, it's binary. Every single element here will have entities which are on the left and on the right. And each single node can have only two other nodes as well. And these two nodes, of course, can have two more nodes and it'll go on exponentially. But then a binary tree will consist of two nodes left and right to the root node. And of course, if you're wondering where binary trees are used or if you're wondering why is a binary tree required when we have something such as a linked list, understand that binary trees provide an ample number of advantages whenever you're using a linked list. And of course, it, it is considered as an extended linked list for the same reason as well. Now coming to question number 10, what is the meaning of a stack? A stack is literally, again, as the name suggests, like a stack of books or a stack of cards. You know, this is another data structure which has been implemented based on real life implementation. So with whenever you're working with queues, you have to understand that data can exit, enter and do anything it wants in both of the directions, left and right, front and back. When you're working with a stack, data can only be worked with in one point of time. For example, if you are if you're placing 10 books on your table right now, uh, you know, to linearly and easily pick up a book, it can only be done from the top element. Of course, you can slide your hand under and pick up any number of books you want as well, but that is not the concept here. The concept here is that to easily able to lift without disturbing other books. So in that particular case, you can only lift the top one and once that's gone, you can pick up the next one, right? So if you think about putting the books in order, if you put book number one, it'll be at the bottom most. Two is on it, three is on two, four is on three and so much more. So if you have to delete an element, you have to pick up the 10th book first. The last book which went in is the first book that comes out. Again, we're going to discuss this concept in the next couple of questions. And with this pretty much stack implementation is again very easy. And of course, we'll be looking at that in detail as well. Now coming to uh, the thing that we were talking about. Question number 11 states, what is the working of LIFO? Well, LIFO, as you can look at it, is an acronym which stands for last in, first out. LIFO is basically telling the user or giving guidelines on how data is accessed and worked on. Because whenever you think about uh, LIFO, think about two data elements and compare it. If you put in something, it means that if it goes in at the last, it's the first one to come out. 
Well, now this sounds very similar to question number 10, right? Because in a stack of books, the last entity is the first one to come out. Of course, LIFO is the governing principle of how a stack works as well. If an element is pushed in at the last, it's the first one to come out. And of course, if you have a requirement where you want to get the first element stored, then you have to retrieve all of the above ones and then only the last one, which is literally the first one, will come out. And with that, we move to question number 12. Question number 12 states, what are multidimensional arrays? As we discussed, multidimensional arrays are these arrays which span in more than one single direction, more, more than one single dimension. It will have a specific set of rows and specific set of columns, just like a matrix in real world. And with this comes more than one index variable because one index variable is for the rows, one index variable is for the columns and more. So the interviewer might ask saying, why do we require multidimensional arrays? Well, one good reason of why you would require multidimensional arrays is when you cannot represent an entity in just one dimension. See, whenever you talk about, let's say, GPS coordinates, latitudes and longitudes, as uh, you might have uh, studied in your college or school days, uh, you know, whenever someone asks for a location, an exact numerical location, you cannot just provide the longitude and say, I am here. You'll have to provide a latitude and a longitude to represent your position as well. So these two entities cannot be split into two data steps, right? To bring it together into one is again a very, very good example of a two dimensional array. And now coming to question number 13. Question number 13 is again asked a lot, so pay attention. It says, are linked lists linear or non-linear data structures? Well, the answer is it's best of both worlds here because it primarily depends on how you're using what the storage policies are. See, it can work in a linear fashion as well in an ordered data set or in an ordered fashion. And of course, it can work in the non-linear structure where, you know, position can be picked up, random data can be picked up based on where it is, what are the strategies uh, that are put into retrieving the data. And basically, this is what forms to give it that linear behavior as the name suggests. So yes, whenever you ask this question, so make sure to tell them that it can be used both as a linear data structures and as a non-linear data structure as well. With that, we come to question number 14. Question number 14 asks, what is a binary search tree? We saw what a binary tree was. Well, what is binary search tree? Well, again, just like a binary tree, it consists of two primary nodes from the root node. So one root node where one of the child nodes is on the left and one of the child nodes is on the right. But if you're talking about binary search tree and since the data is always numerical whenever we work with trees, the value in the left structure of the tree will always have to be less than the root node and values on the right side of the root node will always have to be greater uh, than the root node itself. This is one important thing that makes a binary search tree what it is. Let's say if you have 5 as the root node, elements between 1 and 4 will compulsorily be on the left subtree and elements 5 and above will be compulsorily on the right subtree. And then again in another step where you're breaking the tree into further subtrees, the same rule applies. The primary root node of that little subtree that, you, that we're talking about should have values which are uh, you know greater than the left subtree and less than the right subtree as well. And this is how the entire tree uh, can be generated. With this, we come to question number 15. What is the meaning of FIFO? We saw LIFO, right? Last in, first out. FIFO is basically first in, first out. First in, first out is how queues work in real life. You go first in, you're served first, and then you are outside first, right? So you're first in, processed first, and you're outside first. Well, remember it like that. If you're ever confused between what LIFO stands for or where LIFO is used, FIFO is used, and please do not mug up these concepts. It's pretty easy to remember. If you go first in a queue, you're served first. Think of FIFO, think of Q. And then if you put 10 books on the top, the last book you put as the first one you'll remove. Hence, LIFO, last in, first out. Right. So coming back to FIFO, FIFO is basically, again, just as I mentioned, you'll be served first based on the order. And it's pretty much as simple and as straightforward as that, right? And you can, of course, take a real life example to show the interviewer that your understanding on the concept of FIFO is concrete. Now, coming to question number 16. What is the difference between void and null in data structures? Well, both of these sound very similar, right? Void is like, you know, deficient of something and null says 
nothing so basically there is a small difference whenever you talk about void void basically says that whenever uh, you know there is a certain data which has been uh, declared let's say uh, a variable has been declared but then if it does not have any value associated with that while initializing it means that you know there is no size it means void in computer science terms now when we talk about null null is actually a value it is a value which has no physical presence on the memory but then it's saying a particular state of that element or of that data structure at that given point of time void says that there is no size involved but then null says that I hey i am a value i have no physical presence but i denote something this is the very simple difference between void and null coming to question number 17 question number 17 states what is dynamic memory management well dynamic memory management is a way it's a methodology where you know all of the storage units which are basically used to store your data changes what i mean by this is that as the name suggests since it's dynamic memory is basically managed as in when the data occurs see if you buy a hard drive worth 1 terabyte but then if you only store data worth 1 gigabyte it won't make sense now if you have to store 1 terabyte but then you have a hard drive worth 1 gigabyte it's impossible right but then if you could find out what your data size is and if you could uh, go on to match and store the data into the hard drive one element after another where let's say size is unlimited in both of the cases this is exactly how dynamic memory management will work each of these entities gets separated or combined to eventually be stored and whenever you separate it or combine it they form entities called as composites and these composites are used as entities to be stored on the final data drive as well and these composites basically change in case if your data is changing so make sure you mention that now coming to question number 18 question number 18 is of course the most asked question in all of data structures interviews what are push and pop operations in data structures well a push operation is when you add an element into the data structure a pop element is when you remove a element from the data structure so whenever you think of push think of it that you're pushing an object into something else and whenever you're pulling you're removing uh, one from the other this is the most simplest way that i uh, you know used to remember push and pop operations way way back in the day so whenever you think push think of adding elements whenever you think of pop operation make sure that you're thinking about removal of data from on the data structure it is as simple and straight forward as this coming to question number 19 how is a variable stored in memory when one, when one is using data structures well see whenever a variable has to be stored uh, in memory you have to understand the value that is associated with the variable and how much of space is required to actually manage the memory for that particular entity so whenever your quantity of memory is assigned say you know what i need 10 bytes of data to store this value well firstly it depends on the data structure that's being used and the second thing now whenever you're using dynamic allocation what basically happens is that it understands and knows that 10 giga 10 kilobytes might not be the only uh size that the variable will have it can have 10 it can have 100 it can become 1 gigabyte in 10 seconds and much more so a dynamic allocation will ensure that it will provide ample number of space and it will provide the extra leg room which is required to store this variable and in fact even if there are rapid changes in the size of the variables that it can be stored uh, very well in an effective and an efficient way as we discussed in the previous couple of questions as well so make sure to mention that too this brings us to question number 20 Question number 20 states what is merge sort well as the name suggests you might guess that uh, since it has the word sort it has to do something with sorting elements in a certain order merge sort is one of the uh, Well merge sort is one of the popular methods used uh, to sort elements whenever you have a linear data structure. Now let's say you have an array where you want to perform merge sort on it. Uh the main working of merge sort is this divide and conquer approach. This is this is one very important thing that it add a lot to your candidacy if you mention it's the divide and conquer approach. So basically each of the entities in a merge sort will be adjacent to each other right? So the elements will be next to each other and these entities will get get merged together and these tiny mergings or these tiny entities which are formed after merging will be sorted and then these sorted lists are kept aside another couple of 
elements are taken these elements are again sorted and then put to the left think of it like taking a chunk of uh, uh, you know r- colored rubber bands and then sorting each of these color rubber bands uh, into their final color and then putting it aside into separate units well that is how merge sort works as well you merge a certain set of elements you sort it out you put it to the left you take in more merge it out sort it and put it to the left and now when you combine the entire thing everything from the left to the right will have been sorted because you you took individual elements and sorted it right that is how merge sort works and now coming to question number 21 why should heap be used over a stack well heap is another wonderful data structure uh, which is very helpful whenever you are working with data structures because it is it provides the user with an efficient way to work with again when we talk about data structures when we talk about efficiency you might be wondering is this have to do something with dynamic memory allocation yes heaps are data structures which are basically used whenever you have the data which is which which requires a dynamic memory allocation requirement and uh, you know where the data is removed and added as per the requirement as well so the access times and the storage methodologies the policies and whatever govern heaps in the back end of it which of course you should not be concerned with at this point of time makes it very effective it makes it very efficient to use uh, you know whenever you compare it to a stack but then with the extra added dynamism with the extra added efficiency in read write speeds if you directly compare it to a simple stack the memory time is actually a bit slow why is this a bit slow because you have to have all of these things working in the back end to make sure that dynamism is maintained it is efficient no wonder a complex heap will be efficient when you compare it to a simple stack but then if you're very hardcore about time complexity then of course a simple stack will win so make sure to mention that as well coming to question number 22 what is the meaning of data abstraction well data abstraction is again it's a tool it's a concept which is widely used in data structures data abstraction is a concept of simply breaking down complex entities into smaller problems then solve each of these smaller problems and then eventually you will have solution to the entire problem so this approach this tool this technique is called as data abstraction where you take a complex entity you break it down into simpler steps and further you can break down those simpler steps into even more simpler steps to work with so so it isn't the similar working analogy as a tree, tree data structure you have one entity you break it down into two you break the two into four and much more right so think of it like that coming to question number 23 What is the meaning of a postfix expression in data structures? Well, well, well. Postfix, prefix, and in order traversals are very important questions which are asked in data structures interviews. So make sure you understand each of these. Coming to postfix expressions first, where postfix expression is a situation where you know each of the operator that you have, whatever operation you're performing on operator plus, minus, multiplication, division, whatever it is. this is basically preceded by its operands operands are the numbers which you are working with so uh, you know why we use prefix postfix is to basically ensure you know we have to remove all of the parentheses or to remove any sub expressions uh, wherever you you working with operators because this forms a very vital thing number 1 with operator precedence number 2 if you are performing any sort of lexical analysis uh, you know you working with postfix and prefix expressions will add a lot of value there as well So with that question number 24 is again another very high probable question what is the working of selection sort well selection sort as the name suggests is another way of how you can uh, sort the data selection sort is very simple let's begin directly by understanding how it works so whenever you're working with selection sort let's say if you're working in the ascending order it will directly select the smallest entity first uh, inside the entire array after tra- traversing it once and it will make sure to set the index of that to 0 so what happens is as soon as that is done this element will be compulsorily the first element next it finds the next smallest element puts it on the right of the first one next again look at the entire thing find the smallest one put it in its final place iterate through the entire thing find find the next smaller one put it at its final place so basically by iterating through the entire array you will be putting the element directly into its final position by putting an index value to that this is what uh, is the simple working of a selection sort and of course that is done until all of the elements are sorted now coming to question number 25 what are signed numbers in data structures 
well sign numbers again pretty simple as the name suggests it are it is numbers which will have a bit in the beginning which will basically denote if the number is a positive number or a negative number that this bit that we're talking about it is called as a sign bit and since we're talking about binary if the signed bit is 1 it means that the number is negative in terms of binary and if we talk about the signed bit being 0 it means that whatever number you're working with is a positive number so if the signed bit is 1 it indicates the number is a negative number and the presence of a negative sign if the signed bit is 0 it indicates the presence of a positive sign and with this we come to question number 26 Question number 26 states what are the minimum number of nodes that a binary tree can have well before we move on to the question can you take a quick guess about the minimum number of nodes a binary tree can have well you might have guessed right a binary tree can have zero nodes yes zero nodes or of course a minimum of one and two as well so a binary tree is not a compulsion of having two compulsory nodes a binary tree with just a root node is also a binary tree a binary tree with one node is a binary tree a binary tree with two nodes is another binary tree as well and if you're thinking about how it can be zero in another perspective if there is a null value in your tree as the root node again uh, your binary tree is considered to be having zero nodes as well coming to question number 27 what are the data structures that make use of pointers 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 these these form to be very very important foundational concepts you have to know whenever you talk about data structures so pointers are basically entities that are used to point to an address of an element well why do you want to point to an address of an element to make sure that you can access it from one part of the memory right so let's say if you want to visit your friend uh Uh, who's staying probably one or two roads away and if you know just the person but you've never gone home you will need an address to go to meet this person right this is exactly how data works as well you need the address of where the data is located to work with it to pick it up delete it add to it remove it so pointers are used for that and then when we talk about the use of pointers in data structures it is used everywhere binary trees linked list stacks and queues to denote where each of the elements are and what are the addresses of each of those elements present in these concepts so make sure you mention at least uh three or four data structures where pointers are used coming to question number 28 what is the use of dynamic data structures well dynamic data structures as we have discussed is very similar to the working of dynamic memory allocation here the entire data structure provides the user with a flexibility where data can be stored and manipulated based on the amount of data you know you can work with it so basically it is so flexible that you can change the entirety of the inflow of data the amount of data etc before it enters into an algorithm where it's worked on or before uh, a program is executed as well so a dynamic data structure is very similar to the working of dynamic memory allocation and then of course i'm pretty sure uh, you guys can elaborate on this as well Now coming to question number 29 what is a priority queue we know what is a queue but what is a priority queue well a priority queue as the name suggests is a queue where each of the elements have a priority associated with it now let's say you're stuck in the traffic each of the cars that will move is one after the other right now if there is an ambulance or an emergency vehicle a firefighter vehicle in the back we're pretty sure that all of us will move to the side and give the highest priority to these firefighters or ambulance vehicles right this is exactly how it works here in data structures as well so a priority queue is basically a regular queue but then each of these elements have a priority if an element has a higher priority it means that it will get processed quicker than the element with lower priority so when you're working with priority queues well it can be a question on its own what is the minimum number of queues that are required to work with a priority queue well you will have a queue for the data and you will have another queue where you're storing the priority of the associated data you get it right you have 10 elements on the left side which is the actual data but then you'll have another queue on the right side uh, which is basically another 10 entities but then this is not the data but the priority to the data so if you asked a question saying what is the minimum number of queues required to implement a priority queue make sure to answer it as 2 it is not just 2 it's a minimum of 2 you can of course have more uh, but then these get into the complete range of complex data types but at this point of time make sure you answer it as a minimum of 2 now coming to question number 30 pointers allocate memory for data storage true or false 
well we discussed pointers to be addressing elements right of course the answer is false well pointers basically work as we discussed by pointing uh, the governing data handler to a basic respective location it does not mean it can allocate memory on its own well memory is allocated entirely in a different procedure but then the memory is later accessed using pointers we hope that's clear to you and of course whenever you talk about memory processing memory processing will mostly work in a dynamic environment only when uh, the program begins its execution because only when you're executing it you will understand what the data is required how much data is required and if it changes how you can handle that as well so the answer to if pointers can allocate memory for data storage uh, is true or false is false now coming to question number 31 question number 31 states what is the meaning of dq we saw a regular queue but then what is a dq a DQ is very simple. It's a double-ended queue. It means that, uh, you know, very simply, you can add or remove data from any of the two sides of a queue. Of course, if you're wondering if we can implement this on a regular queue, yes, you can implement this on a regular queue and basically use it as well. So what this does is when you're talking about linked list, there's a concept of doubly linked list or circular linked list. Here, you will have the data element and a left pointer and a right pointer and much more. So whenever stuff is double ended where data has to be accessed from both the ends or removed from both the ends, you will be implementing a DQ or in short, for double-ended queues. Now, question number 32. Differentiate between linear and non-linear data structures. Well, we discussed this in the very first couple of questions, right? Now, let's get back to that in a little more detail. As I've explained before, a linear data structure is when data is stored next to each other in a linear fashion, in an ordered fashion. A non-linear data structure is basically an entity which is stored in memory where it's not next to each other and it's stored uh, in a haphazard way when you look at it literally. See, for example, each of the elements in arrays, linked list stacks and queues are stored right next to each other. Of course, they can be stored anywhere in the memory. We're not talking about the addressing of the memory. We're talking about them literally being there. So in linear, the data is stored next to each other. But then when we're talking about graph data structures, when we're talking about tree data structures, it is non-linear. And of course, when you go on to visualize both of this, you will get a clear cut picture of what the difference is between a linear data structure and a non-linear data structure. But then one important thing, make sure you give examples to support your claim and your understanding of this as well. With this, we come to question number 33. Question number 33 states, what is the meaning of an AVL tree? Well, we saw regular trees, we saw binary trees, and we saw binary search trees. Now, what is an AVL tree? An AVL tree is basically a simple type of a binary search tree itself. Well, an AVL tree is different from a regular binary search tree in a way where it's only one part of it is being balanced. Not the entire tree ha it has a compulsion to be balanced like a binary search tree. Now then, what is balance? Balance is basically when you're directly comparing the height of the subtree from its main root node, right? So... If the balance is off in a binary search tree, it can be considered as an AVL tree. But then if the entire tree is perfectly balanced and if it's non-ambiguous, it can be called as a binary search tree. That is a simple AVL tree. Coming to question number 34. How does the Huffman's algorithm work? Again, this is a very widely asked question. The Huffman's algorithm, basically, whenever you're working with Huffman's, you have to understand that you will require one table which is which stores the frequency of occurrence of elements. If you have like 10 elements occurring 100 times each, you will have one table in Huffman's algorithm which will basically state that, hey, this element is occurring these many times. So, why is this required? Well, whenever you're constructing extended binary trees which will have a lot of subtrees or which will have only minimum weights, you will require a method to keep a track of this easily. Huffman's algorithm is the governing entity which helps you keep a track of this by uh, giving you the frequency of occurrence where each data entity or each element uh, presence is denoted in a structured format. And of course, you can explain this with an example using a sheet of paper as well. That will add a lot to your candidacy. Now, Coming to question number 35, what are recursive algorithms? Recursive, as the name suggests, 
is a methodology where you're doing something in an iteration. You're doing something again and again in a loop. So a recursive algorithm is an algorithm which will work by taking a complex problem and solve and simply breaking it down into simple problems. And these simpler problems are worked on in a loop format in an order one after the other to solve the eventual big problem. So when you talk about recursion, the output of stage one of recursion will be the input of a stage two of the next loop of the same thing. Now the output of the second one is the input of the third one. So that is how recursion operations work. Whenever you talk about recursion, you're talking about looping and you're talking about how data moves in such a way that the complex problem can be broken down into simple entities and handled at the easiest way possible. And this brings us to question number 36. Question number 36 has to be the question that's been asked probably in all of the data structure interviews, right? Well, question number 36 states, how does bubble sort work? Well, bubble sort is basically another sorting methodology which is applied to arrays where elements are next to each other and values are compared. The working of bubble sort comes when uh, the adjacent elements, two elements right next to each other are compared and based on uh, where they're supposed to go, they're directly changed. This is a very simple understanding of, let's say, if you have uh, an array which says 1, 3, 2, 4. Now you compare 1 and 3. 3 is greater than 1, so the 3 stays right there. Now you compare uh, 3 and 2. You realize that 3 is greater than 2, but 3 is on the left side, but 2 is on the right side. So you just swap 3 and 2. And that's how it works in an iteration. That is how a bubble sort works simply. And so if you're wondering why a bubble sort is called as a bubble sort, it's only because of the direct comparison between a bubble floating to the top of the water. But then anything heavier than a bubble will of course be sinking to the bottom end, right? If you're thinking of comparing a bubble to a rock and when you throw it inside the water, the bubble will float above the water while the rock will sink. This is exactly the working of how uh, you know you can understand the working of bubble salt as well. With this we come to question number 37. Question number 37 is an interesting one. It says which is the fastest sorting algorithm that's available? And in fact, this question is very subjective because there is no fastest, you know, sorting algorithm that's available, which is one algorithm which does everything. So when you're working with data structures, you're trying to solve a very specific niche problem. This particular problem that you have can be sorted very quickly using bubble sort, but then you will have another program or another problem you have to solve, which can be solved the fastest using merge sort. So the answer here is that it directly depends on the data and how the algorithm process, processes the data as well. So there is no single fastest sorting algorithm. It is based on your data. It is based on how the algorithm works as well. And the concept of time complexity is used here to track what is efficient and what is not. With this, we come to question number 38. What is the postfix form of the expression you see on your screen? X plus Y is multiplied by Z minus C. Now again, if you remember, we're doing the prefix and the postfix expressions to basically keep the data ready for lexical analysis and to remove the presence of our brackets as well. So here, the operators are preceded by their operand. As you can see, X, Y, then we have the plus, and then we have Z, C, where we have uh, the minus after the operands. And then of course, there is a simple formula. There is a simple structure that you'll be using to work with postfix expression as well. So my advice here is to make sure you take up uh, certain examples on your own, see what the formula is and then solve it because if you are given a random prefix or a, if you're given a random expression by the interviewer to solve, you will of course uh, have the ability to do so as well. But then to keep it simple in this question, we have given you the output as is. But then make sure to practice on how you can get here as well. With this, we come to question number 39. Where are tree data structures used? Well, again, well, as all of the other data structures, even tree data structures are used in a lot of places. And then, but then these are some of the most important places where tree data structures are sort of championed. You know, whenever you're working with lexical analysis, whenever you're working with hierarchical data modeling, step-by-step -step data handling, uh, whenever you're working with something called as a symbol table, where when you're creating a symbol table, you will be using a tree. And then whenever you're handling basic uh, arithmetic expressions as well, tree data structures are 
used if you want to perform traversals in order pre order post order you can do so in a tree data structure as well so whenever you ask this question make sure to give uh, two or three examples of where it's used of course more than three will again be an added advantage but make sure that they are accurate and not incorrect as well this brings us to question number 40 What are the data structures that are used to implement graphs? Well, whenever we have to implement a graph, we are literally not drawing a graph using programs here, right? A graph is a data structure. Now, when you have to implement something called as a graph, you need two important data structures here to implement one data structure such as graph. Basically, we are talking about adjacency matrix and adjacency list. So adjacency list is used to tell you and it's used to represent the data which will go in and the adjacency matrix is to basically tell you if your data is sequential and how you can go on to work with and store the sequential data as well so whenever you are asked saying how are graphs implemented make sure you mention two things adjacency matrix which will show you the sequential data representation adjacency list which is used to represent linear linked data Well this is pretty much the most straightforward answer to this question. With this we come to question number 41. What are the data structures that are used in DFS and BFS algorithms? Well DFS and BFS are again uh, acronyms for depth first searching and breadth first searching. These are again concepts which are used to perform searching operations uh, when you're working with data structures. But then know this when you're working with depth first searching you will be basically using the stack data structure and whenever you're using breadth first searching or the bfs technique you'll be using a queue so if it's depth first it's stack if it's breadth first or bfs it's going to be queues and of course if you think this might get a little confusing just just try to see if you can find a way to remember it in a simpler way but then if you have actually worked with data structures or if you have had experience using these then it becomes quite literal of why a stack is used in the in dfs and why a queue is used in terms of bfs as well now coming to question number 42 What are the time complexities of linear search and binary search? As I mentioned linear search and binary search are basically two forms of searching and each of these are uh, different in its working and of course binary search is more efficient than a linear search. And how do you track this part where you say it's more uh, efficient right? So basically with time complexity uh, we can understand that with each iteration of how the working is. So we have something called as the big O notation where we consider how fast an entity can execute for that particular values as well so at this point of time to answer the question and to keep it concise basically you need to understand that the time complexity for a linear search is o of n but the time complexity for a binary search is o of log n and then o of log n you don't you don't have to explain the working of it it's basically the working on the logarithmic scale but then in quite literal terms it means that the binary search is of course more effective it takes lesser comparisons to search and it takes eventually lesser time to find an element in an array with this we come to question number 43 Question number 43 uh, asks where are multi linked data structures used well multi linked data structures are very very important in two concepts uh, when we talk about multi linked data structures make sure you understand that it is used wherever you require a sparse matrix and wherever you have to create an index uh, you know wherever you have to perform any operations with respect to data handling so when we talking about sparse matrices and if you answer this question with Uh, saying that you know it's used to generate a sparse matrix the interviewer might ask you what a sparse matrix means so basically a sparse matrix is a matrix which will contain minute number of non zero elements so it is a matrix which will consist mostly of zeros and less number of actual elements so it's basically used as a way in numerical analysis and scientific computing where it denotes only the functional components which are required in the matrix while omitting the ones which are not so in case if you are asked a follow up question saying what sparse matrices are you can use that answer as well so coming back to the original answer a multi linked data structure is used in the generation of these sparse matrices and it is used whenever you have to create indices for data entities as well with this we come to question number 
what is the methodology that is used when you have to perform in order traversal well in order traversal is when you have an operand on the left the operator on the middle side and another operand on the right side in case if you're working with binary operations but then if you're working with trees the question is asking you about trees right of course when you talk about traversals mostly it's trees so the tree is basically sought out and traversed through from the leftmost subtree uh, after the left subtree is processed the root node is processed after the root node is processed the right subtree is processed this is how it will work in the individual subtrees as well as the entire tree on the whole as well first the left is processed the middle element of the root element is processed next the right element is processed now if you break the tree down into another subtree again their left center and right is the rule which will go on for the working of in order traversal as well and then there is a good chance there is a follow up question which would state what is post order traversal then well post order traversal is basically when you traverse the left subtree first and then instead of going to the root node you will traverse the right subtree after the right subtree is visited you will come back to the root node so instead of left root and right as in order traversal with respect to post order traversal you will do the left first the right uh, subtree the second and then come to the root node so make sure you understand these subtle differences uh, because understanding them and remembering them is simple uh, but once you start implementing them it can slightly get it confusing so with that we come to question number 46 question number 46 states uh, are there any disadvantages to using queues or what are the disadvantages uh, when you're implementing queues when you're using array well whenever you're using an array you need to understand that with queues you might have any number of elements which can be added or removed right so if you are if you're standing in a queue at your favorite restaurant to get your table or something it's not like five people stand there at a time right so you can have five people standing 10 people standing 100 people waiting for their tables so with array whenever arrays are created their sizes are not dynamic by default of course you can have dynamic allocation but then so it provides a situation situation where there is a discrepancy when you're creating the correct array size because you do not know uh, you know how long your queue is going to be and in this case how many elements uh, you will have when you're working with queue that's one disadvantage the second disadvantage is that whenever you store uh, queue elements right it cannot be reused so it's basically stored once and if you have to reuse it you cannot why is this because whenever you think about working with queues literally as the name suggests insertion will happen only at one point of time when you insert data at that point of time and keep pushing your data one on to the other you can use it only once you can use you cannot use it more than once and this will cause memory dumps where you're just uh, making it a little less efficient because you are adding a bit of discrepancy here too so whenever you asked about the disadvantages of implementing queues using arrays make sure uh, you talk about array sizing and memory dumps now with this we come to question number 47 how can elements be inserted into a circular queue a circular queue is where one entity of the queue is connected on to the other and the last one eventually is connected to the first one as well so it's placed in a circle now if you are asked about how elements can be inserted in a circular queue make sure that you talk about two conditions two cases uh, you know so basically the first case is when the front value is not zero but then the rear value is is max minus 1 when you talk about this particular condition it means that your queue is not full that is what rear is equal to max minus 1 states uh, if your queue is not full then of course you can start implementing and inserting elements at that point of time the second case is where your rear is not equal to max minus 1 If rear is not equal to max minus one, it means that the queue is not full, and this indicates that you know you can add on the values wherever you require. But then, since we're talking about queues, you will only have to add these values at the rear end of it. That's why we're checking if uh, uh, the rear end is either uh, less than max minus one, or in fact, if it is not equal to max minus one. Now, these concepts are if you're wondering about why it's been named like this. Uh, this is exactly a standard. structure that is uh, used to go on to write code uh, with, with respect to handling queues or handling stacks or any other data structures as well of course it can be anything else but then to keep a uh, readability at its high uh, the namings have been given as such so make sure you mention these two cases with this we come to question number 48 question number 48 states what is the use of void pointers 
we know what regular pointers are they are used to uh, you know basically address and index an element in memory now what is a void pointer a void pointer is basically an entity that is used uh, you know whenever you have to store another pointer well a regular pointer points to data a void pointer will point to another pointer it has the ability to store up data of a pointer right so it's pretty simple it's so it's as simple as that a void pointer is an entity which is used whenever you have to store another pointer inside of it and this pointer which gets stored inside of course it can be a regular pointer where it's pointing to the variety of data uh, that it is usually used for so where is void pointer used well it's basically used whenever you have to implement multiple linked lists which are not similar to each other as well so now if you have a case of implementing these linked lists in multiple programming languages and if you have to bring it together at once you will require one pointer which is pointing to another one where you're storing the data of that pointer as well in that particular case you will be using a void pointer with this we come to question number 49 What is the meaning of the stack overflow condition? Well, stack overflow as the name suggests that your stack is literally overflowing. It means that your stack is completely full and whenever you insert any more elements, it is not possible to store it into that stack. So, a, an easy way to remember this is to remember a, a stack which is actually overflowing. So, let's say you have 10 books in your uh, locker or you have 10 books on your bookshelf, but then you don't have space for the 11th one. So, this means that you have hit a stack overflow condition. Of course, this is a direct analogy of how it works here as well. but then if you are asked to state the condition where stack overflow happens well when the top element is equal to the max size minus 1 it means that the stack is full and the overflow condition has been hit so make sure to mention that condition if asked now question number 50 have you earned any sort of certification to improve your learning and your implementation process well it is of course advantageous to have a certificate in whatever concepts that you're looking at it might not be just data structures it can be anything data science python data visualization so whatever it is uh, a certification will of course boost your candidature a lot you just basically proving uh, to the interviewer that you have put in a good amount of time you've put in a good amount of effort uh, in learning new things and implementing them and that you would want to do that for a good amount of time in your life as well so basically when you ask this question make sure uh, you talk about your certification attempt what you learned in that certification the projects that you did and how you solved uh, real world problems as well because with this you telling the uh, interviewer that you have a strong aspiration to progress in that field and that you're an effective learner followed by having interests to build your career on that so this is a very important question where you can you know change the direction of uh, the interview as well so list all of the certifications if you have talk about what you did in the certifications talk about what you learned and how it's been helping you to apply in fact uh, for this job that you are interviewing for as well so with this we conclude the top 50 questions that are asked in data structures interview questions we wish you all the best for your interviews and we hope uh, that you got all of the clarity that you require on how you should approach a question and how you should answer them effectively using this uh, session as well with that i hope you have a nice day ahead